For part three of this series, we're going to go back to some charcoal. In order to do this correctly, I'm going to get my old traditional charcoal sets out. I'm going to be drawing with compressed vine and even Conte crayon. The goal here is to sort of wake up my body, wake up my hand, wake up my mind, wake up my eye to looking for those big uh, shapes of tone, those big value shapes, those big blocks of light and dark. Thinking in this way is sort of the traditional artist's um, bread and butter. This is how the traditional artist thinks about constructing an image. This is how the traditional artist thinks about um, constructing light. This is how the artist thinks about um, painting every single thing from a lemon to a portrait to a landscape. And you can see in these beautiful portraits by John Singer Sargent, he's, he's, there's almost no part of the face that's pure white um, or paper white. There's tone everywhere, even in the subtlest areas. And you can see even in this one, which is pretty high key, it's really kind of washed out in the highlights. There's still tonal differences between the left and right cheek and so on and so on. As we look at those pictures, as we did our traditional charcoal warm-ups, we get into the tools with Rebel. And every single time I use the charcoal tools, I love them more and more. If you have a digital tablet that uh, calculates tilt, you're going to love it even more because the tool is going to spin and twist and express the line direction and the tilt direction of the tool as you actually handle it, as you actually twist it and turn it. It's an amazing thing to see. Um, here I started with more of the kind of the linear um, hard edged charcoal and then I'm going in with this um, kind of broader stroked uh, tool with um, you know still full opacity uh, just still blocking it in. Um, it works wonderfully and you can very very quickly get a sense of your subject and you can you can put in subtle tones and big broad strokes and you can really start to construct that volume of the face of the cheek of the nose of the lips you can construct all those values with almost no effort um, drawing in charcoal is kind of a nice hybrid between drawing and painting it's um, you know, if, you, if you're working in, in a traditional sense, you have a pencil. A pencil is a very narrow, tiny little tool. If you're working in paint, you're working with broad, um, very kind of elastic tipped uh, tools. And, and they're very expressive. They have a lot of um, kind of uh, serendipity about the way the, the marks go down because you have hundreds of little bristles that collect and hold paint in different ways depending on what kind of bristle it is. Um, and so Painting obviously has a huge and much more varied vocabulary in terms of the stroke and the mark making that you can get from pencil. Um, but in the middle there between pencil and, and, the, and, and the paint is, is charcoal. Charcoal has got a lot of that paint kind of vocabulary, but a lot of that pencil style control. And so here with digital charcoal, you have the ability to have even more control, obviously. Um, and just it's just a fantastic way to warm up it's a fantastic way to kind of practice your thinking as what you're trying to do when you're working in charcoal is just like in paint is you're trying to uh, establish where the the shadow families are and the, the light families are so you're getting your light and darks separated out um, you get your half tones your mid tones you get all these these things kind of laid in and then you know then you have your picture and so um, if you like to work in you know more detail, you know, maybe like in this one, you get some suggestion of eyelashes and then the direction of the hair for the eyebrows, and you know you you can do that, um, but you don't have to. I think the real key is is drawing, painting, constructing the light. Um, you always want to be able to tell where the light is coming from, what's the light direction, um, how strong is it, um, what kind of surfaces is it hitting. Um, when you're dealing with skin, you want to be able to speak to the way that the um, individual highlights are, are different between like the wetness of the eyes, the softness of a cheek, the different um, moisture and texture of lips um, and hair and so on and so on. And you get to do that with, you know, with great confidence. Um, 
because the, the light is very, very, very distinct in all of those different materials. Um, so as you can see here, um, using the basic built-in, you know, part of the software, charcoal tools, you can get an amazing outcome with almost, like I say, no effort. It just seems to happen. If you can focus on the shapes of shadow and the shapes of light, that's really all you need to do. And that, that was the goal of, of, you know, getting into this picture. I was just looking through a bunch of old portrait examples, portrait references, and I was just grabbing stuff that was going to give me a continually more and more obvious um, blocking of darks, blocking of light, so I could see the big shapes. I love the the shapes and the contours of the shadows um, in and around the helmet and the way that framed the face. So I thought, oh, that's perfect. Just kind of doing some um, doing some warm ups, right? And then when you're doing those warm ups, you want to have some you want to make it a little easy for yourself sometimes, so you don't get all tired out before you get to the actual painting. So that said, um, I know we're working on you know the the sergeant technique, the sergeant look and feel, but really what we w want to do is is make our job easy, make our job uh, fun, start getting some of the concepts and using charcoal is a great way to get that going. It's just such a, a cool uh, connecting piece back to that traditional art technique, that workflow. Um, as a traditional artist, I always have some charcoal with me and um, there's been so many times where, you know, maybe you're out playing or painting or you're, you're at a park or you whatever. And if you have a piece of charcoal and a, pa a piece of paper, you can do really beautiful work um, and you can do it rapidly because you can get all that quick coverage um, that you can't get with a pencil. You can do uh, really a lot of work right away really fast. So now on to our final step. I just wanted to take um, a moment and show you the tools I'm using and the technique I would use to do a sergeant style charcoal. So. Um, couple things is is with you know with that translation between digital and traditional you can't get like the perfect brush I mean unless we sit down and make our own brushes but what I found is that the built-in brushes with Rubel are actually pretty perfect and you can see that I'm able to get a very quick um, approximation that's very accurate of Sargent's style and approach to using charcoal. This is, is so cool. So just a couple tips. Um, you can use white uh, for highlights. You can go into the opacity of the brush and drop it down so that you have, you can more easily get sort of your, your mid-tones. Um, but for the darks, keep the opacity at, at you know, full 100%. But for those mid-tones, you might want to just kind of soften it a little bit. And then you can see here that just, um, with very little work, um, very quick, very fun, uh, you can you can get a beautiful outcome. And then I just wanted to take a quick break uh, from the charcoal. And before we jump into some quick paints and some time lapses, I wanted to just show you again some of the tools I use uh, for getting individual sort of like effects from from the way that Sargent would do maybe sort of his transparent backgrounds. This uh, transparent background is a really common um, a, a common uh, I guess technique from even plein air artists uh, today modern artists that if you've got darks and you want them to read as deep you paint transparent and you do that in rebel with like watercolor so you can you can kind of do this this wet watercolor underpainting especially with those sumi brushes and a couple of other ones and it'll give you that feeling of transparent, see into it kind of shadows. And that's really great to do as you're laying. Then you can put your thicker brush strokes on top of that. And this is very conducive to this John Singer Sargent style. So that's something I wanted to just kind of make mention of. So you can kind of play with that. Here's the settings, the visual settings, etc. Now I love this. This was kind of a fun thing. I thought it'd be really cool to play with uh, how the palette knives work. And you can use those in lieu of the brushes and um, just making sure that we're our brushes in that blend and paint mode. Um, it's that kind of middle setting of the of the three between just like full on paint, full on blend and full on like smudge. It's that 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 three version on the keyboard. I think you can go one, two, three, four or whatever, five on the keyboard to change the different blend modes. But 
um, using these tools that I'm showing you here, the, the soft bristle and in the you know the palette knife various brushes here, just showing you how you can get the meaty, chunky, actual physical texture of, of Sargent's work, um, painting something as loosely as he painted hands. Sargent was a master painter, and you can see that especially in the way that he handles painting hands. When you zoom in and just crop everything else away, and you see these beautiful uh, strokes of color. I mean, just look at that kind of very hot, um, almost like uh, apple red thumb that's there, just one quick brush stroke, and he leaves it raw and it's beautiful. The paint has dimension, body, uh, bristles, it has everything. And, and he leaves each mark there confidently, boldly. He doesn't blend it out and, and try to delineate each edge. You don't see fingernails and you don't see um, each individual crease of the knuckles. You don't see any of that. All you see is the, the light. Remember, what we're painting is not, and we think about this in this traditional painting approach, especially with Sargent, you have, you're not painting objects so much as you're painting light. And if you, if you had a, a painting of a hand like this and you had fingernails and wrinkles and folds and all the various details that are in a hand, you would, you would be looking at that hand way too much. Um, the hand needs to be there. It needs to read like a hand. It needs to feel like the lighting reads accurately. But it needs to feel as a supporting character in, in this project. It's not supposed to be just... Um, you know, just as important as the as the portrait or whatever. Um, you know, and as I'm playing around with the thumb and trying to get that one bold stroke that he he did for the hand, I just kind of fumbled that. But um, what we can do is, you know, we can keep keep at it. It's digital. You can try and try and try again. So try until you feel like you get the right look, and try to leave it. You know, one stroke and done, um, and we go from there. Just kind of keep moving, moving, moving. Um, I find like cropping in on an area like this, if you want to do like a master study, is a really good way to warm up, practice, and get into the vibe of, of what the uh, master artist was doing. Um, sometimes we do a master copy or a master study or something like that, and you, you do like a whole scene, the landscape, or a whole portrait, or whatever. It's, it's a bit much, um, but here in a sort of a distilled fashion, we can get at some of the techniques without having to kind of do a whole giant painting. And so that was the goal here is to show you like how that all works. Um, and since we're doing a lot of portraits, it's necessary that we do uh, at least one part of a portrait here. Um, I know this is a crop from um, a multi-person portrait, a uh, family portrait uh, that is very, very famous. So what I'm doing here though is just color sampling from the master's uh, painting him, himself uh, and, and trying to not just capture the colors obviously that's the easy part but especially with color picking um, uh, which you don't have to use it was just uh, something I was using here quickly to to just reinforce some of the the goals I wanted to, to show here which is uh, is brush selection and some of the settings so that you can get that really wet on wet feeling um, it's you know where like the dark brush stroke connects with like one of the lighter brush strokes and those two paint strokes blend together um, that's something that you've really got to have a tool like Rebel for. Otherwise, you're going to be faking out those blends. You're going to have to be like uh, pretending that the paint is blending and doing all sorts of trickery to make it look like that. But with this tool, it's so nice. You just boom, you just push that that color into the other color. And it, it starts to, to merge. It, it blends realistically. The colors do what they should do naturally. And then you move on. Um, here for the highlight on the eye, I was just kind of struggling to find like what is the exact tool because I'm always wanting if I can to find one stroke to tell the story one stroke to make the impact one stroke and that was what I was trying to accomplish here um, and so you know finding the right brush putting that one stroke down there it is you know it feels feels about right and so once you get to this point you can say that you're you can tell whether or not you've got the spirit of the master artist's uh, work and I, I feel like we're there you know we got it and it looks looks really good I wanted to show though too is that once you um, maybe have your initial painting done a lot of artists and they did this back then they do it today there's a technique called glazing which is where you take either a lot of medium or a lot of turpentine and you mix it into a little bit of pigment and you make this kind of like really translucent slurry of 
of paint and um, you can brush that onto an area and what it does is it tints or glazes the area. You can use it as a value corrector. You say, oh, I need to make that. I love how it's painted. I love the face, whatever, but it's too light. You can glaze in a darker value on top of it or you can glaze in a warmer value or, or, or you know a cooler tone or whatever it is and that way you can don't have to do any repainting but you get to make some changes so that your your painting reads correctly and you can see um, as I zoomed in on some of the sergeant work I could see there was this um, what looked like glazing where, where it looked like you took some of, of a color and kind of made that like really transparent slurry and just kind of painted over and tinted or glazed some of the existing paint. So I wanted to try that and using the watercolor on top of the oil like that is, is a really cool way to make that happen. Um, the thing that's just it's something to sort of like pay attention to but it's something that's very powerful is um, in Rebel how do you you know get that right brush with the right brush strokes and and how do you make it you know, come to life in the way that, that you want it to. So um, I had unending amounts of fun with this. Um, I think it keeps you kind of on your toes when the paint can actually actually move and blend and, and drip on your canvas. It's, it's uh, pretty thrilling stuff, to be honest. Um, it's a far cry from Photoshop, you know, and, and you know, we, we all probably paint in Photoshop too, but like um, painting in, in Rebel is like, it's a whole nother unbelievable world and I absolutely love that I could show you some of these techniques.